Hi, my name is Ken Lebo, and I practice in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Before we begin, begin today's presentation, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Zeiss for the chance to talk about one of my favorite subjects, corneal topography. Today we're going to talk about using the Atlas Corneal Topographer in clinical practice. And before we begin, there are a number of indications that I'd like to talk about. First of all, I want to make the statement that corneal topography has become the standard of care in the industry. Uh, we no longer use corneal uh, keratometers, more particularly, we like to use corneal uh, topography because it gives us so much more information. We're able to evaluate corneal shape instead of just the three measurements that we use in the keratometer. We're able to utilize the technology to improve our contact lens fitting ability. And more importantly, in many ways, we're able to make certain diagnoses based on corneal topography to look at things like uh, keratoconus and pellucids marginal degeneration. The tool is phenomenal also for the use of evaluating uh, refractive surgery patients prior to surgery so that we make no mistakes regarding uh, operating on the wrong individual. Uh, also for patients that you refract and you find that all of a sudden uh, they're not getting the level of acuity that you'd like to achieve, corneal topography is an excellent diagnostic tool uh, in that regard. Uh, it also is very important to, to realize that uh, monitoring changes in the cornea over time are extremely important. Now while there are a number of different topographers on the marketplace today, the one that I've used and have been using for several years is the Zeiss Eye Profiler. Uh, just to digress for a moment, uh, I find it to be one of the single most accurate auto refractors on the marketplace today. And secondly, it incorporates the Atlas Topographer, which I have worked with for many, many years and gives me the ability to maintain the knowledge and form-based uh, interpretation of data that I've become so familiar with. And finally, it incorporates an aberrometer within the uh, technology, so we actually have higher end uh, wavefront distortions that we can evaluate both in the total eye and uh, on the corneal shape. Uh, one of the nice things that uh, Zeiss offers based on this technology is their iScription lenses, which are optimized to deal with uh, pupil size and improve uh, the ability of patients to see at night. So it's really a uh, tremendous instrument and one that I've enjoyed working with uh, significantly. Now, if we get back to uh, corneal topography, I need to point out that uh, corneal topography is a code that can be billed to an insurance company. The CPT code is uh, 92025, and uh, the way it reads, and I'm gonna digress for a minute and just read the, the statement from uh, Medicare, corneal topography is a covered service when medically reasonable and necessarily, and necessary, excuse me, only if the results will assist in defining further treatment. And particularly uh, conditions such as irregular astigmatism, keratoconus, uh, pollutions, marginal degeneration, uh, corneal transplants, penetrating keratoplasties, uh, and corneal scarring are uh, venues, are, are, are diagnoses that are approved for the uh, medical reimbursement of the uh, procedure. However, that being said, there are a number of other procedures, mainly in the fitting of contact lenses, where medical reimbursement of the procedure simply doesn't happen. And what we use in practice is what's called an S-code. Uh, and so what I mean by that is that it's not insurance reimbursable, so we bill that procedure to the patient. And usually with my contact lens fits, we bill that once uh, and it covers all the times that we're going to, uh, to use the procedure. So it's uh, another way that uh, you may want to consider 
raising your fees uh, by utilizing uh, an S code for corneal topography. Now, the presentation for the rest of the time is going to be a little bit technically advanced, shall we say, uh, but you have to appreciate certain basics of corneal topography. Uh, if you're listening to this, you should know the difference between sphere and cylinder as it relates to uh, form recognition on corneal topography images. Uh, you should know the difference between symmetric and asymmetric uh, topographies. You have to appreciate the different scaling issues because if you uh, have one image on a different scale, uh, for example, auto scale versus custom scale, the two images may be identical, but they may look totally different. Uh, there are different maps, and we're going to talk about those. Uh, axial, tangential, elevation are some of the key ones that we look at. And there are also some very key indices that uh, you need to pay attention to and, and be able to appreciate. Now, all of these are kind of basics or corneal topography 101, and uh, there are opportunities from Zeiss uh, on a different website, uh, and we'll put that up on a slide later on, that will give you the source to, uh, to look at those uh, uh, more basic technologies or more basic information about corneal topography. Uh, the slide that you're looking at right now actually demonstrates some of the different shapes and images, what we call, what I call, form recognition. You need to be able to look at an image and appreciate what that image is telling you, at least in a very general way. So the image to the upper uh, left portion of the screen is uh, with the rule corneal astigmatism and it's edge to edge. The image immediately adjacent to that is an against the rule uh, uh, corneal topography and what's interesting is you can see the difference between the first one which is fairly symmetrical and the second one which is asymmetrical. The big image just below those are is an image of Pellucid's marginal degeneration and we're going to talk about that more later as we get into the presentation. The uh, smaller image immediately right of the Pellucid's image is uh, a spherical cornea with a prolate shape, and the one adjacent to it, its final lower right image, is a uh, roughly spherical refractive surgery image, which actually uh, represents an oblate shape. And, and that's one of the key uh, values of the eye profiler, because it enables us to differentiate between prolate and oblate shapes, which is very important. Okay, so some of the topography maps that are really valuable, in my opinion, are the Pathfinder 2 map, uh, the Master Fit map, which enables us to work with uh, developing contact lenses for these corneal shapes, and the elevation map, if you haven't put in your particular algorithm for fitting contact lenses, we can design it based on the elevation map, and I'll share with you how we're going to do that. So I'd like to talk with you today a little bit about how I use the uh, Atlas topographer, the eye profiler, uh, in my contact lens practice. We use it for uh, routine fittings uh, for all contact lens patients to design spherical, aspheric lenses and multifocal lenses. I use it for uh, traditional RGP lenses, both uh, keratoconic and non-keratoconic patients, uh, mainly to determine the initial shape and to monitor the changes in that shape over time. And then I use it a great deal in specialty contact lens fittings, uh, keratoconus, pellucids marginal degeneration, uh, penetrating keratoplasties, uh, really unusual and unique uh, cases that just need uh, a good evaluation so we can design the curvature of a contact lens to optimize the fitting relationship and then secondarily to optimize the uh, visual relationship. So, the maps that I use primarily are a right-left compare map and what you see on the screen of this computer is an interesting case that I saw just a couple of days ago on the 26th. 
a patient came in and wanted contact lenses. The husband, coincidentally, is a keratoconic patient that I had just fit before. And my staff will always pull up the right-left compare map so I can get a lot of information about that patient immediately. And this was a fascinating case because it really shows lots of interesting situations. <clears throat> Excuse me. The upper left uh, image is the axial map of the right eye. And what you should see here from form recognition is the presence of a fairly large with the rule cylinder, with the rule astigmatism. And it shows about a diopter, a little over a diopter and a quarter of, of astigmatism. This is a fairly normal presentation. And in fact, if we went to the overview map, we would see, whoops, this is the right eye. Let me go back to the, I'm sorry, that was the left eye. Let me go back to the right eye. When we look at the with the rule, Pathfinder tells us very nicely that the likelihood of this eye being normal is approximately 81%. So when we look at the with the rule astigmatism, there are no hot spots in the elevation map and the rings are very normal, we know that we have a very normal situation uh, in the right eye. But if we compare the left eye to the right eye, you should notice right away that there's a pretty red spot on the bottom of the axial map of the left eye. The astigmatism is about a diopter and a half. And from pattern recognition, this should tell you <clears throat> that there's superior flattening and inferior steepening, one of the hallmarks of keratoconus, although there are a number of other situations that will mimic keratoconus in a topography situation. So now, if we look at the overall map, again, lo and behold, we see that the topography is associated with what we think is, or with what the computer thinks, is a keratoconic pattern. So the next thing that we're going to do when we look at this is go to Pathfinder, and now we see a great deal of more information that, that really shows us why this is uh, diagnosed, it's not really diagnosed, suggested to be keratoconus. So, 55% uh, likelihood of keratoconus, pattern recognition shows an inferior steepening. When we look at the key indices of corneal irregularity, it's just slightly irregular. When we look at apical toricity, which is the TKM value, it's actually fairly normal, although slightly on the high side. And when we look at the shape factor, it's again fairly normal at 0.4. Anything above 0.6 or greater actually is an indication of keratoconus. So the question is, why did the Pathfind why did Pathfinder at this point make a diagnosis or make a suggestion? Uh, I, I need to clarify. Software does not make a diagnosis. <clears throat> Only practitioners can make a diagnosis. The software helps us make a diagnosis by suggesting what these form images represent on a statistical basis. So if we look at the mean curvature map, we see that the mean maximum curvature is 46 diopters. It's located in red. We also see that the mean inferior temporal superior nasal, or the inferior superior index that other topographers will utilize, is high at 2.7. And that's the reason that <clears throat> this particular individual was, that was suggested to be keratoconus. So right, if you, if you have the opportunity to look at this before you go into the exam room, you're going to see uh, a lot of information. You know exactly what's going on before you get into the exam room. Okay, so we've already looked at the right-left compare map, which is very valuable. The other map that I like to use a great deal is the overview map. 
and we've demonstrated that with the previous patient. A third map that I like to use a great deal is a difference map because it gives us the opportunity to monitor change over time. And that's really what we want to look at when we deal with ongoing patients. And what you see here uh, on the computer is two images, uh, August 10th of 05 and February 28th of 2012. And you can see that there are some changes uh, in the shape of these two images as demonstrated by the map on the right, which is the uh, difference map. The area of red shows steepening relative to the two maps in this area and flattening below that. So clearly there's been an influence of the contact lens on this eye over a period of time. Uh, this individual had refractive surgery and the result of the refractive surgery was actually rather poor vision and we needed to fit a reverse geometry rigid gas permeable lens to the eye and this is how I would monitor over time the, uh, the effect on the eye. Now another very valuable map is this trend analysis map. When, if you're fortunate like I am to have patients come to you for many, many years, you really want to know over time what is going on. And this map shows four different images. Uh, the first one on the left is 2004 all the way up to 2012. And you can pick the images that you want, but it also demonstrates uh, a long-term view of the health of this particular eye. Now, in this second image right here, something changed. The meridional axis shifted to about 40 degrees, where previously with the other three images, it was at about uh, 80 degrees in one, three, and four. Uh, so something different happened here, and right now I don't recall exactly what it was, but you can now come down and look at uh, the eccentricity values, the sagittal height values, the apical radius values, flat K, and compare mean values with standard deviations so you know how much of a change over time uh, this individual is experiencing. Let's apply some of this uh, corneal topography basics and the different types of maps to another individual that I have uh, in my practice. I, and what I want to do is talk about some soft toric lens fitting and how the corneal topographer has helped us in this regard. So in 2002, this young lady, Beth, came to see me. She was an 11-year-old girl. I had seen the whole family. And she was moderately nearsighted with some moderate astigmatism. Uh, she, over the years, was fit with uh, AccuView Advanced Toric lenses and has always worn them. Uh, she really has had no major issue with her eyes over time. Uh, the key with the topography evaluation is to look at the initial curvatures and see how they've changed, if they've changed over time. And so therefore, let's look at some of the topography and uh, see what it tells us. So as I said before, the first thing that I'm going to look at is the right-left compare maps. And for Beth, um, there's really nothing out of the ordinary in this particular map. Uh, you can see uh, against the rule corneal astigmatism in the right eye and then a slightly oblique against the rule corneal astigmatism in the left eye. She has just over a diopter and a half of uh, against the rule astigmatism on the cornea and refractively her right eye has two diopters of against the rule astigmatism. The left eye shows about a diopter of astigmatism and refractively Beth shows about a diopter and three quarters of astigmatism. So these are very normal maps. The next thing that I would do would be to look at the overview map 
And um, the overview map, again, in the left eye shows the oblique astigmatism. It shows that it's normal uh, based on pathfinder analysis. There's no uh, unusual elevation and the topography, excuse me, the ring images are perfectly normal. So if we now want to look at, as you can see, have a lot of data on this particular patient. Uh, and if we look at uh, the, the right eye, again, everything is normal. This was the initial evaluation, excuse me, this is the latest evaluation, 2013. If we wanted to look at the baseline evaluation, how was she in 2002 for the right eye? This is the, uh, the same information and it shows essentially the same uh, data without any uh, particular change. Uh, the reason that this says Pathfinder 2 can only analyze certain data, this is very old data, 2002, and when I purchased my eye profiler, it was, all of my old data was imported into the new device, and unfortunately, Pathfinder 1 was used in the old um, uh, technology and Pathfinder 2 is now used in the new technology and the two weren't exactly compatible so you can't see old Pathfinder uh, data. Uh, and here again is the uh, left eye, uh, the oblique astigmatism, everything is perfectly uh, normal in that regard. So the other thing that we'd like to see is the trend analysis. Now here you have a trend analysis 2002, 2003, 2004, and twice in 2004. And when I look at the flat K mean, it's 44 units, 44 diopters, and the standard deviation is a quarter of a diopter. So I know over a period of two years, Beth has had but a quarter diopter change in her flat K, and if we look at her steep K, she's had less than a quarter diopter change. What that tells me is that over time, the contact lenses are not inducing any type of corneal distortion to this gal's eye. So a very valuable piece of information. Now, if we want to change and look at more contemporary data, we need to eliminate the data that we have here and let's pick the last four images and say OK. And now the flat K change from 2010 to 2013, it's up a little bit, it's 51. It's a half a, it's, it's a, half a diopter in the right eye excuse me, in the left eye over time. But if you look at this particular second map right here that I'm pointing to, the December 21, 2010 map, you notice that there's a little bit of swelling or a little bit of steepening. I can tell you clinically it was associated with swelling because she had come in having spent the night at a girlfriend's house and slept in her lenses overnight and we found a little bit of uh, steepening of the curvature which is not present in the first, third, or fourth map. The steep K, as it turned out, uh, was only, uh, on average, uh, the standard deviation was 0.09 diopters. So again, very, very stable, very, uh, um, very good consistency over time. Now, uh, if you have a, a shorter period of time that you want to look at, another way of doing this is by the three difference map. And the way this map works is that you have two axial curvatures um, on the, we well, have three on the top. The first two, the difference map is below the first two. And then the second one, the difference map of two and three is below here. 
This is very useful also, by the way, uh, for dealing with uh, refractive surgery patients that will um, show you the immediate surgical effect and then the healing effect over time. So Beth uh, is a great patient and a little plug for Beth right now, she's in optometry school. So um, it's, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with her and just demonstrate how we use corneal topography in a very straightforward, basic, simple uh, situation. So now what I'd like to do is go into a much more complicated situation. And this is a, a little bit more interesting, I think. Um, if we again look at the right-left compare, you see uh, oblique corneal astigmatism, which looks a little asymmetrical. You see a little bit more red inferiorly in both of these axial maps. The patient has over three diopters of corneal astigmatism in the right eye, and just at, or just slightly over, uh, three diopters of corneal astigmatism in the left eye. And again, these are oblique axes at 22 in the right and 160 in the left. These are the topographies of a 18-year-old white male that came to see me a number of years ago. This was in 1997. He was wearing soft toric lenses for about three or four years. Recently, his vision had changed, and of course he was leaving for school within the next week or two. So I really didn't have a whole lot of time to work with him in this initial fitting. He needed new lenses, and we refit him with soft toric lenses. His corrected visual acuity at the time with the lenses was about 2020, 2025. But if you look at these images and you have good pattern recognition, you should be slightly aware that maybe they're not exactly what they represent. So if we go back here and now look at the overview map for the right eye, Unfortunately, the Pathfinder data is missing, and again, this is because we had to import, import the data. But one of the things you should pay attention to when you look at imaging is the shape factor. And the shape factor was 0.63. So that should at least raise some suspicion in your mind that maybe this is not a completely normal eye, regardless of what the computer generates the information to be. If you look down at the ring image, and I think what we can do is, is bring up this individual image, you see that the rings are slightly slanted, but they're full and complete, so there's really not any suspicion of keratoconus based on that particular ring image. If we then look at the left eye, again, nice, clear, sharp, crisp rings. And if we go back to the overview map, again, everything looks pretty normal. We don't have this data uh, because it was an imported image. And the shape factor was only 0.49, below the threshold of 0.6. So the patient was satisfied with their improvement in vision, and we sent him off to college. Well, a year goes by, and in between, this patient is refit by another practitioner. And uh, when he presents back in my office, he has significant epithelial bulli. The entire epithelium, as you see in the photograph on this slide, is bullous. It's swollen. It's edematous. The other practitioner had changed the fit. For whatever reason, his vision has fluctuated. And that should be another clue that may, we may be dealing with a keratoconic situation. So he's back in my chair. 
And clinically, this is what I see. So if we now look at the image of the topographer, first of all, you notice that we get very incomplete data right here. The shape factor says 35, but it's incomplete data, so some of this is really um, inappropriate. And if we look at the ring image individually, we see a whole bunch of distortion, which is most likely due to the swelling that was present. But what's really interesting now is if we do the difference map in the right eye, this was in 1997, and this was a year later in 1998 below it with incomplete data, the difference map here on the right shows very, very significant changes. Now the question is, are those changes due to the swelling that was present in the eye, the epithelial bull eye, or is there something else going on? Okay, so let's look at the other eye as well. And again, in the difference map, you see the original image from 1997. And now, a year later, 1998, it looks very, very different. And when we look at the difference map, we see that there's central steepening and superior flattening. We come back here and it says 0.91, so that eccentricity value really has increased a great deal. And now my suspicions are that while the, the swelling may be part of the problem, this individual over the past year may well have developed a, a condition of keratoconus. So what did I do? Uh, I put this particular individual on Muro drops to try and eliminate the corneal swelling. And uh, if we look at the change over time in this three difference map, this was the original image. This was image with swelling. And here you see the difference. It's steepening and flattening, just like keratoconus would. If we compare the second image to the third image, the third image is a week later, and the patient has been using hypertonic saline in an attempt to, with, to, to pull all the fluid out, reduce the swelling, and see what happens. And look what happens here. We're still getting steepening, and so I'm starting to think more and more that this is an individual with uh, keratoconus. So let's switch eyes and look at the right eye. The first image, he has some keratoconus. This is now uh, dealing with the Muro drops, one week difference, and this is three weeks difference because I treated the patient for three weeks with Muro drops to try and get rid of the swelling. And you can see that the pattern recognition is keratoconic and there's still some steepening going on. So if we look over here at the overview, you see a very, very distinct pattern of keratoconic uh, development. And if you look at the ring image, you can see how this ring image is distorted and creating uh, a keratoconic eye. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do for this particular patient, for Joe, we now know that he has developed keratoconus in the years since I've seen him. He's got poor vision. And what we need to do is design a rigid gas permeable contact lens to improve his vision. And this is where MasterFit comes in very beautifully. And all I did was come over to the display and click on MasterFit, and that brought us, it loaded the topography image, and you can see the map image right here. This is the axial map 
of the keratoconus. And what we really want to look at is the elevation map, however. And so the computer has designed a uh, contact lens for us. In this case, it defaulted to a back toric contact lens, which in my opinion, I would not recommend for uh, a keratoconic eye. So let's change that. Instead of a back toric lens, let's look at a spherical lens and do the custom sphere and say, okay. And right now it's thinking. And what you see is a suggested curvature. The green represents lots of pooling. The uh, tear film depth is as much as 113 microns. And then uh, in this area right here, uh, it's only 13 microns. So we don't have a very uniform basis for a contact lens fit. If you look at the uh, elevation map, however, this contact lens fluorescing pattern literally matches the elevation map. And we'll, we'll talk more about that, but areas in blue are below a reference sphere, and in this case, the reference sphere is a 780 millimeter curve, and that's why this has pooling. And this area in red is elevation above the 780 reference sphere, and that's why this is thinner and has touch. So what we can do is flatten the curvature, and I'm flattening it by increments of 0.05 millimeters. And what we're doing is really getting more touch right here in the center and more pooling in either of these two areas. So another way to eliminate that pooling would be to reduce the size of the lens. And if we took that down to an 8.8, .8, uh, we get a nice, fairly nice pattern there. Uh, but we have some uh, bearing superiorly and this just isn't going to be a great fit for this particular individual. So one of the things that I like to do is to look at aspheric lenses and we have an algorithm in here for the Menicon Z aspheric lens, which I just chose. And now the computer is going to show us what that lens would look like. And I'm not real happy with that particular fit. So we want to steepen it up a little bit. And we actually did a little too much. And now we want to reduce the size of the lens. And we're still getting the bearing. So this way, you're at least enable, you're, you're able to simulate what a contact lens would look like on the eye to before you put the lens on the patient's eye, and it's really a, a big time saver. So let's go back for a minute now and look at we're not going to save that. Let's go back and look at these changes. And so we eventually fit a contact lens on this patient. And we're going to look at the topography that occurred when we fit that contact lens. So you see, and let me change this one to the initial exam. So what you see here is the initial exam, the development of keratoconus, and you can see the difference map clearly showing the development of keratoconus associated with corneal thinning. Now, we made the diagnosis here of keratoconus, and we fit a contact lens to that eye, and what you see is this area of flattening, and the reason that this is black is because the uh, rings were distorted, but this has flattened 
as a result of the contact lens being placed on the eye. And now let's switch eyes and you can see again, let me get back to the original. Here's the development of the keratoconus again, the original map, upper left, number two, the development of keratoconus. Uh, after the use of Muro didn't solve the keratoconus, got rid of the swelling. Here's a very clear keratoconic pattern. Here, number three, we fit the uh, rigid lens and you can see the flattening associated with the contact lens. So that's how I would utilize uh, corneal topography in this much more complicated situation because the patient started off with uh, soft toric lenses and all of a sudden developed keratoconus. Okay, let's now take a look at how MasterFit works. Uh, certainly the first thing that you want to do is to select an eye that uh, you're going to deal with in corneal topography and I've done that in this uh, particular situation. If we just look at a few of the parameters, uh, the eye has uh, 52 by 53 diopters of oblique astigmatism. The shape factor is 0.43. Uh, while that's still a little low, this patient actually does in fact have keratoconus. And so uh, what we're going to do is try and use MasterFit to design the contact lens software. Now the first thing that usually pops up is uh, a screen asking us to enter the appropriate uh, prescription data, uh, but I've already uh, bypassed that. Uh, you can just put in the dioptric values of the over refraction or the parameters of the lens and the software will calculate the spherical uh, power uh, for you or the toric power, depending upon what your needs are. Uh, so we're going right into allowing MasterFit to design the contact lens for us. And built into MasterFit is a whole host of different algorithms which are designed to uh, utilize unique fitting opportunities, either um, spherical, different manufacturers' spherical designs, or uh, front toric or back toric or bi toric or aspheric uh, contact lenses. And what that has done is put their unique algorithm into the computer so you don't have to call the laboratory to find out what needs to be done uh, on this particular case. Uh, basically, you want to look at what the elevation map is in comparison to the fit of the lens. Because as I mentioned before, that's really the key tool in terms of evaluating contact rigid gas permeable contact lens fits. An elevation map is created by determining the best fit reference sphere to the topography data and in essence, that's almost the same as the base curve of a rigid gas permeable contact lens. So if we look at this elevation map here, we see a, a hot spot right in the center, which is the uh, height of the keratoconus above the reference sphere. And that correlates very nicely with this area of very, very thin fluorescein under the contact lens. So an elevation or a red spot on an elevation map is going to cause touch on a fluorescein pattern where a depression on the elevation map, this whole area in blue, which is below the reference sphere, is going to create a great deal more pooling. And so you see right here that there's a tremendous amount of pooling surrounding this area of apical touch. Now we're using a spherical base curve to fit a 
very aspheric cornea because keratoconic eyes have a higher eccentricity than the normal uh, spherical cornea does. So in this case, we tried a uh, custom spherical fit, and I believe in this case, we're dealing with a now an aspheric lens design, and we're actually getting a little bit of touch, but lower levels of clearance. So let's see what happens if we steepen the base curve, we're getting a whole lot more bearing out here in the periphery because it's almost blacked out, which means that the lens is too large. And if we go to an 8.8, it's still a little too large because we're getting bearing. Unfortunately, the Menicon Z does not come in a design less than 8.8 millimeters. And so we probably want to flatten this curve just a little bit to get back. Oh, sorry, I'm going steeper. And now you see how we can change the parameters of this uh, lens design going from a spherical design to an aspheric lens design. So that's very useful in terms of allowing you to spend less time with the patient and more time with the computer design to come up with a fit that works even better for you. Now, in this particular case, uh, the slide that you're seeing in front of you now shows the patient's actual fluorescein pattern of the lens that I fit on the slide uh, on the image to the left, the elevation map on the top right, and the master fit simulated fluorescein map on the bottom right. And you see very nicely how all three actually correlate perfectly. In this particular situation with the center uh, cone with the center nipple cone, if you will. Uh, the elevation was centrally, and when we fit the lens in this situation, there's a slight amount of bearing that you see centrally on the fluorescein pattern demonstrated by both the actual fit of the lens on the eye and the simulated pattern. Surrounding that in the mid periphery, you see a little bit of pooling which is predictable based on the elevation map and is demonstrable on the master fit map. So all three correlate beautifully and that's why you can utilize this type of software in the eye profiler to design your rigid gas permeable contact lenses. Okay, so let's look at another example of keratoconus and how master fit again can be utilized to design the initial lens to save you time in the clinic. So this patient uh, is a former patient of mine. These images were taken in 2003. Uh, obvious keratoconus in form recognition. Shape factor is uh, 0.69 and 0.70. And clearly that demonstrates uh, a, an aspheric, uh, highly aspheric cornea associated with keratoconus. The corneal irregularity measures are up two and a half and 2.2, and the apical tericity is very high at 48 and 49. So it's very obvious that this is a keratoconic patient. So if we were to look at the right eye and look at master fit, It's the right eye, and the first recommendation is a spherical contact lens with a 750 base curve. I actually wound up fitting the patient with a steeper base curve in an aspheric design, which is a normal equivalent to a spherical lens, but you don't see too bad a fluorescein pattern right here. If you look at the thickness 
of the tear film underneath the optic zone, it's fairly uniform. It does get a little higher superiorly and inferiorly, and that's because when we look at the elevation map, the height of the elevation map, the highest point on the reference map is right here, and that's associated with this faint area of with the rule touch in the center. The lower areas are superior and inferior, and that's why you see pooling in these two areas. So let's switch over to what the aspheric lens design looks like. And when we do that, we see that it's a little steeper centrally, and we could probably flatten this uh, base curve a little bit. That was a tenth, so it's about 730. And here it is at about 740. So with the Menicon Z design and a 9.4 lens, between a 740 and a 730 would be the first lens that you would want to put on this patient. The concern that I have, this has a little bearing here and here, and if you look at that on the elevation map, you know why it's bearing, because these are higher points and therefore thinner areas of fluorescein. So the way to fix that would be to reduce the diameter, and now we don't have quite as much bearing, and so somewhere in a 730 base curve with an 88 diameter, and their eccentricity is 0.4, we have a fairly reasonable fit to get started with. So what I actually did was use a slightly different aspheric design, which was actually instead of 0.4 was about 0.65. And when we look at this image on the slide, you can see that I used a 710 base curve with a 90 millimeter size, and that pattern is a beautiful fluorescein pattern. One of the biggest issues that I have in fitting contact, contact lenses to keratoconic patients is selecting the first base curve. If you do it simply on the basis of keratometry readings, you're really losing a lot of information. And do you go with the flat K? Do you go with the mean K? Do you go with the steep K? You, you put a lens on and you evaluate it and you change three or four different lenses. In this particular situation, by using the algorithm that I designed for this unique aspheric lens, or the algorithm for the Menicon lens, which is built into uh, iProfiler MasterFit, you're very quickly and very easily able to fit that lens one lens on that eye and the fluorescein pattern, the fit evaluation is accomplished. It was a perfect fit. Now, if we look at the left eye for this patient, the first lens is a little flat right here. So, and this is a spherical lens. So if we steepen up that spherical lens a little bit. We're eliminating this central touch area, which is associated with this area right here. And now we can make the lens, if we took it down to an 8.5, notice how much more uniform this pattern is, and that works out very nicely. If we now, and I think this should be the now that's still the spherical. Let's go to the Menicon. Here's the Menicon Z aspheric. And again, we've gotten a little bit of touch here. And so we probably want to go just a little bit steeper, but we have to watch out for the bearing superiorly. So when I designed this lens for the patient using a slightly different uh, aspheric design, the first lens that went on 
was a bit steeper because it was more, had a higher eccentricity, perfectly normal. And you see in this fluorescein pattern that there was central, not central, but central to superior pooling of the fluorescein. A uh, little too steep a lens, and so we wound up fitting, a, placing a second base curve a tenth flatter on this eye, and as a result, we wound up with identical base curves, beautiful fluorescein patterns, and this patient has been wearing lenses for probably a good seven to ten years, and unfortunately, I haven't seen him much uh, since then. But uh, that happens. The next thing I'd like to discuss with you, we've talked a lot about keratoconus, but there are a number of different images that look like keratoconus that may not actually be keratoconus. Patients that have a displaced corneal apex may not have keratoconus, but they're going to show superior flattening and inferior steepening. Uh, patients that have contact lens induced corneal distortion will oftentimes show superior flattening and inferior steepening. Both of those mimic the form recognition of keratoconus. Another confounding issue is the case of pellucid's marginal degeneration. Keratoconus, as it turns out, is a mid-central thinning disorder. Pellucid's marginal degeneration is a peripheral corneal thinning disorder. And as a result, while they have similar patterns, there are some unique differentiations between pellucid's marginal degeneration and keratoconus. And I'd like to just share that with you for a few minutes. Uh, clinically, pellucid's is uniquely different from keratoconus because it has a fairly large amount of against the rule or oblique astigmatism. Usually you find much more irregular astigmatism with keratoconus. In the slide that you see in front of you now, it almost appears as if there are birds kissing each other. Uh, that's a very typical form factor in Pellucid's uh, marginal degeneration. Some have even described it as a mustache pattern or a gull wing appearance. So if you will uh, compare the top image here, which is keratoconus, and the bottom image, which is Pellucid's marginal degeneration, you see both the superior flattening and the inferior steepening. But remember, the key difference between them is where the thinning takes place. This composite image shows an axial map for keratoconus in the top left and a axial map for pellucid's marginal degeneration on the bottom right. This next image is of elevation maps. And what I've done is create what's called a peak elevation indicator. This is nothing more than measuring the distance from the center of the eye to the steepest, excuse me, to the highest point on the elevation map. And it turns out, because of the differences in where the thinning takes place, the peak elevation indicator will actually be further from the apex of the cornea in Pellucid's cases than in keratoconus patients. So what I've done in this situation is evaluated about 50 patients, each of whom have either Pellucid's or keratoconus. And there are some unique topographic indices that you should keep in mind when trying to differentiate these two cases. One is the shape factor. Pellucid's cases usually have very low prolate to even an oblate shape factor. That means simply that the center of the eye is flatter than the periphery of the eye. Whereas keratoconic patients 
have a very high prolate shape factor, which means that the center of the eye has a steeper curvature than the periphery of the eye. If we look at the flat K reading and compare Pellucid's cases with keratoconic cases, the Pellucid's case is usually a much flatter flat K reading. And in my study, it indicated about 42 diopters was the mean flat K reading, while the patients for keratoconus, on average, were 45 diopters, and the standard deviation was even higher, which is typical of what we would find with keratoconic eyes. The TKM value, which is an indication of apical corneal tericity, is also lower in Pellucid's cases, 45 diopters, versus 50 diopters that was present in keratoconic patients. But when we add in the peak elevation indicator, we see that in Pellucid's cases, it's almost three and a half millimeters away from the apex of the cornea. That is the highest point on a Pellucid's case is further away from the apex of the cornea than in keratoconic cases, which was only 1.95 millimeters. And this is a very easy and key way that you can look at your maps and differentiate between Pellucid's marginal degeneration and keratoconus. One of the other areas of uh, challenge in a contact lens practice is corneal distortion. Uh, it's often confused with keratoconus because it does show superior flattening and inferior steepening. And what I'd like to do uh, as this last case example is take you through a, a case of corneal distortion that presented in my office and the corneal topographies associated with that and then how I redesigned a rigid gas permeable contact lens of very meaningfully different parameters to reverse the corneal distortion and give this patient back a, a normal uh, cornea that she's entitled to. So, um, Let's take a look at a little bit of history. Uh, the patient that we're dealing with is a 17-year uh, wearer of contact lenses. The first 13 years were in uh, rigid, were in PMMA lenses, and then some seven years after that, she was wearing rigid gas permeable uh, contact lenses. Uh, she usually can wear them all day without any uh, particular problems, but about four years before seeing me, she was refit with some contact lenses that she reported were never comfortable and never really provided uh, the vision uh, that she was accustomed to. When I saw the patient, the lenses were fairly flat-fitting lenses. Uh, they were displaced nasally over the limbus, uh, there was very little, if any, blink-induced movement, which made me think that we may have a rigid lens compression syndrome. Uh, there was some moderate to excessive edge lift, poor surface wetting, and the lenses themselves were very scratched. The parameters uh, are what you see here. It was a uh, 752 base curve. It was pretty much on the flat K with a relatively large lens diameter of <clears throat> 9.6 millimeters. In this slide, you see the compression ring when the lens is removed, showing that uh, most likely this was a bicurve lens because you can see both of the uh, curvatures. In addition, there was some central stippling which kind of confirmed my diagnosis of rigid lens adhesion syndrome. So let's look at the topography of the right eye uh, and see what's going on here. So here's the uh, right eye topography. And the first thing that you want to pay attention to 
is that the shape factor is about 0.04. At 0.04, we're dealing with a very, very low prolate shape. <clears throat> and that's not typical in a normal corneal anatomy. When we look at the pattern uh, on the topography map, we see what looks like the presence of a very faint uh, with the rule band centrally, but significant flattening temporally and significant steepening inferiorly. This is simply not the type of uh, topography that uh, we would associate with a normal cornea. So if you want, we can look at the master fit suggestion and let's look at the elevation map. And what is being recommended here is a custom spherical lens with a 728 base curve and a 90 diameter. And actually, this looks like a, a pretty nice fitting contact lens. Um, when I selected the contact lens to fit the patient, I actually used a 728 diameter 90 lens, so we're significantly steeper than the original contact lens, which was a 752. But the lens is smaller, so we really don't see a whole lot of bearing, but we are going quite a bit steeper. And if you can see right here, the actual fluorescein pattern of the lens on the eye demonstrates a uniform uh, fluorescein pattern with ever so slight bearing in the three and nine o'clock position. To get rid of that, all we really have to do is make the lens a little bit smaller. So the question becomes, what happened to the corneal topography when we made this lens a whole lot steeper. And lo and behold, a lot of things changed. We got rid of the inferior steepening. We're now developing a very nice with the rule corneal topography. And we have a shape factor of 0.2. Originally, it was 0.04. And what we have achieved is a popping up of the ocular surface. The cornea popped out where before it was compressed or depressed. That cornea now is popped out into a much more normal, healthier shape of this with the rule band pattern. The other indices, the corneal irregularity measure improved and the corneal apical tericity also improved. What was meaningful with this patient is that I could now prescribe a pair of glasses for her to interchange between contact lens wear and eyeglass wear so that she wasn't totally dependent upon contact lenses which distorted her cornea. So if we look at the difference map now between the original corneal distortion that you see on the top and the final result of with the rule astigmatism, you see that what we've done is steepened the central portion of the cornea, these red areas, and flattened the peripheral cornea that was originally steeper. So we've taken a very unhealthy contact lens fit and turned it into a much healthier contact lens fit. And now the patient was uh, able to see better out of her lenses and wear the lenses on a much more comfortable basis. So I would share with you in concluding that corneal topography is a vital tool to use in your contact lens practice. The iProfiler Plus gives you the opportunity to not only do these auto refractions, but to really delve into the intricacies of different parts of corneal topography so that you can not only understand what's going on in the ocular surface, 
but design appropriate, comfortable, rigid gas permeable lenses to solve all these problems. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Thank you very much.